In 2013, we began a film about Christian Freeland, who had written a bestseller about income inequality. How close are you to it? Uh, she's on at 14. The book was called Plutocrats, from the Greek Plutos, wealth, and Kratos, power. A perfect description of the World Economic Forum that meets every winter in Davos. Mr. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Charlie. I'm going to show you the email to prove I'm not a moron. I, I'm sure you're not Do a moron. Do you believe that? I, believe I am actually a moron about many things, but... Okay, okay. We're, we're literally on air in about three minutes. Let's hold that email on. There we go, perfect. The biggest tribes in this sort of 0.1%, a group I call the plutocrats, are the financiers, private equity, investment banking, the Russian oligarchs. Uh, these people... Uh, have businesses all over the world many times. Uh, they hang out in the same places. And they are relatively so much wealthier than uh, what we're used to in the last 50 or 60 years. The world's 86 richest individuals now own as much wealth as the poorest half of humanity, 3.5 billion people. And much of that is dark money spent to control the political process. The gap between the people at the very top and everybody else has grown hugely over the past three decades. The top 400 richest people in America, wealth in that segment has quintupled. She's not anti-wealth, you know, because you feel she's not an ideologue, she's a, she's a journalist. But I think her big worry is that these plutocratic uh, regimes or plutocratic groups in different countries have the power to, as she says, you know, remake the rules in their own favor through the political system. They have so much money and so much influence in their own political systems, including the United States, that the plutocratic class can fix the game. They're companies, their financial organizations, their manufacturing firms are favored in a way that, that stops social mobility from another level. Well, it's not simply an important issue, it's a reality. A gross disparity in terms of income with an oligarchic elite that is pulling down obscene amounts of money. I mean, the head of Walmart makes $11,000 an hour. Um, CEOs because they are able to impose austerity on their workers, essentially keep unions out, drive wages down, cut benefits, are rewarded like plantation owners. This obscene disparity between the people at the top and the people at the bottom that is now wider than it has ever been in the entire history of the world. I mean, it is now that the gap between rich and poor on Earth is greater probably than in uh, France just before the revolution. Once you have that gap, the temptation even unconsciously, to use that extreme economic power that you have to wrest political advantage for yourself, for your company, for your sector, becomes, I think, really irresistible. It's now industry. Industry is a third party. And they are the, and they are the owners of the government. They run the show. They can alter the rules of the game and pay people to ignore things and get into the, into, the, into the justice system and so forth. And when you fix the game at this level and with the kind of uh, communications we now have around the world, internet and so forth, you can generate a little bit of a, you know, a, a volcano that may just go off. Many plutocrats come to Davos to privatize the public sector. But not all of them. George Soros has invested billions to champion democracy, threatened by tyrants like Russia's Vladimir Putin. He accepts in sort of a core part of his being that the world can change overnight, that social orders are human constructs, not natural laws, that you can be living in independent Hungary one day and in Nazi Hungary the next day and in communist Hungary the day after that. But George has this unique ability to be able to actually see the reality. 
Russia is 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 sinking economically, uh, and uh, it's being taken in the wrong direction by Putin. And this can be, and is being said uh, uh, inside the regime. Putin has to cling to power because it's the only place where he can feel safe. Two years later, I was in Kiev with the same bankers and politicians, meeting to expand markets and lay the groundwork for Ukraine's entry to the European Union. What's that read of the current situation? The ceasefire is holding a bit. Yes, yeah. You guys know Larry Summers? Larry Summers, good to see you. Hi. How's everything? Um, good. Yeah. Complicated. Life, uh, Hi, Christian yeah. nice Freeland. Really nice to meet you. The elephant in the room was the war with Russia and whether a fragile Ukrainian democracy could survive it. We've seen the same plot in this movie again and again and again. This is not conflict between Russia and Ukraine. This is conflict between two civilizations. This is not a political movement that arose in Donetsk and Luhansk. This is a Russian invasion. There were Russian troops in regular formations on the ground in eastern Ukraine. Before that, there was artillery fire, airstrikes, helicopter penetrations. But there is a threat to European security. It's not only Ukrainian security. As if to draw a line in the sand with the West, Putin had invaded first Crimea, then Donetsk. Ukraine did not seem to have either the army or the money to stop him. Across the street from the conference, Ukrainians explore the possibilities of democracy. Every hour, couples are married in a cathedral, once reserved for the plutocrats. Ukraine was once a perfect plutocracy. A landed gentry owned everything, ruling a nation of serfs who owned nothing, replaced today with the promise of an egalitarian society, a level playing field. Never know Kiev is only 500 miles from the killing fields of the war. It's become a city in the global economy, where the 1% and the 99% live side by side in a vibrant consumer society. But not everyone's included. On the sides of the freeway that connects the new Kiev to the old, illegal markets spring up where desperate farmers sell their goods. I asked one woman how she makes a living. She said by selling vegetables and socks in the winter. 
She did not choose this life, all she can do to keep her household afloat. As the demands of war increase, the economy suffers. Ukraine negotiates a customs union with Europe, but it favors the wealthy. I begin to understand what living in a plutocracy means to poor people. In the fertile countryside that surrounds Kiev, more and more local boys are conscripted to fight in the war. Everything is for sale. Plutocrats even scrape up the soil itself for transport to Germany. In 1988, I had visited my relatives in western Ukraine. They lived and worked on collective farms. People who lived in um, viable, I would say even vibrant villages, they had they had the church, of course, right? They had a village library, and then the woman who was sort of running the village council, who would do things for you, and there was the, the common pasture land where everybody had their jobs. Left without jobs when a local sugar beet factory shuts down, families have to survive on what they can grow. The animals they keep for meat and dairy consume what's left. Every leaf, stem, and root is put to use. They are obsessed by their garden. What they're cultivating, how much they're taking off, what she's already can preserve, this kind of thing, right? This is not just like folkloric Ukrainians in their garden. This is feeding themselves. because of the, the rise in prices since the austerity program was imposed after the EU association agreement that was signed between Poroshenko and, and, and the EU some months ago. Right? Good, very good. <laughs> The town has a common pasture where each household grazes its cow. Geese spend the day at the community pond. Neighbors trade in barter in place of a consumer economy. Centuries old traditions being lived out by a final generation. Threatened by a recent $17 billion loan to Ukraine from the World Bank stipulating the development of genetically modified crops. Will family farms here be able to compete with multinational agribusiness giants like Monsanto? The shores of the Aegean, the wine-dark sea of the Odyssey, the ocean of antiquity that lies between Turkey and Greece. Today its waters are crossed by Greek ferries, loaded with refugees from the war in Syria, a million men, women and children in the last year. Each night the ships pass Cape Sunian and the temple of the god Poseidon, to the Greeks the shaker of the earth. The world's earliest democracy took root here in 416 BC, but lasted only a century. In ancient Greece, Periclean Greece, uh, the rich men in the polis were expected, not obliged, but expected to give to the public spirit and the common good. They built temples, gave blessings for anybody who was a citizen of Athens. They get the idea of giving to the commonwealth from Prometheus. Prometheus is the titan who gives to mankind heat, light, freedom of thought, stores of memory. As long as the rich put more emphasis on their store of virtue, 
than on their hoard of wealth. They can be looked at with admiration, not with envy and resentment. But when they put too much emphasis on their hordes of wealth, that's when it slides toward plutocracy. Two ships approach Athens, first a luxury liner returning from the islands, the timeless privilege of wealth and power. Behind it, a ferry from the war zone, laden with refugees fleeing the destruction of their world. They arrive in a dysfunctional country, caught between the demands of European banks and a plutocracy of notorious tax evaders. Greece is uh, very well known for philoxenia, which means hospitality, when they come here because of a better life that we cannot really offer now because we are going through our own economical crisis. We have a very high percentage of unemployment. We cannot employ them, we cannot give them, but still people give them things from their own refrigerator from their own pocket. The governments go by papers, we go by feelings. Stephanie Sampson is an Athens artist. As her neighborhood has been battered by the recession, she has begun to paint the homeless outside her door. you speak yeah. you're a smart man yeah. how yeah, how smart. you speak so many languages yeah. Mustafa, Mustafa. Stefanos Mustafa 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 are you from Israel uh, no Palestinian you're Palestinian yeah. long time before this together uh-huh where can you work uh, yeah I go there for work. I work and I go back. Uh huh. Stop the video. Stop it going now. Bella, quickly. Out. Out. Here. Police area here. Police area. Police area. Like Ukraine, Greece is a marginal economy, forced to depend on loans from German banks. As much as its government tries to provide social services, it lacks the necessary revenue. Kids love art because they're so tactile and physical at that age. And, you know, they've been traveling, they need to play. Children can be joyful under many circumstances. The refugees have everything they own carefully packed in their backpacks but no idea of what fate their future holds. In this time of severe income inequality, more than ever Greece depends on tourism. Rich foreigners who come to buy trinkets and enjoy the ruins. I began to search the internet to find out what ordinary Greeks felt about the crisis. We're here to, to demonstrate against this new deal uh, because its measures are uh, the most antisocial measures uh, voted in any memorandum. It is up to the people here uh, to make a real change in the future. We're going to stay as long as it takes in order to take our lives back. We are not free to rule our country. 
we don't have our future in our hands. Crisis is not for all. It's for the people who don't have. For the people who have, who own, there is no crisis. It is better times now for them, and not a crisis. Crisis is for the poor people. They're being forced to pay for the malfeasance of their banks, for the speculative bubbles that were created by their banks. Government serves the interests of international financiers and banks at the expense of, of the average man and woman in the street, and the suffering in, in countries like Greece now is quite severe. A mile from the Piraeus, where the refugees come ashore, lie the marinas of the plutocrats. I talk to local fishermen who've seen their harbor taken over by the billionaires who control the world economy. So in Greece, there are plutocrats? Yes, many. And uh, all of them must go to jail. Elmir Kab, owned by the former Prime Minister of Qatar, costs $250 million. It can accommodate 50 guests, each in their own stateroom. The owners of the media, the owners of the big ships that we have, the owners of the factories, they don't pay taxes, they don't obey the laws. There are no laws for them. They can do anything. It, Rich people have the power, not the prime ministers, not the president, people with money. They rule the world behind the curtains. They play with our future and with our lives and with our happiness. In Athens, a magazine editor, Costas Vaxavenis, is arrested for publishing the Swiss bank accounts of Greek tax evaders. $200 billion have left the country illegally. The protests by now a daily occurrence in Athens turned violent. While the tax evaders go free, thousands lose their jobs to please the austerity agenda of the European banks. The special interests of the rich ravage the Greek economy. High on Mount Parnassus, the ghosts of a lost Greek democracy haunt the temples of Delphi. Myth says that dolphins once led Apollo to this sacred place, home to an oracle who could solve the country's problems. It was a place that people but to learn, to see other people, to talk. We used the theaters to talk with the philosophers. Philosophers could come here and talk with the people, to teach the people. And everybody could go. It was free, of course. The rich people had to pay for the poor people to do whatever they could not do. The rich people had to pay. The rich people had to offer because they could not do otherwise. Just looking the river that goes down there, the Temple of Apollo, the view, enjoy here the silence. Representative government had its roots in the soil. A rural culture of shepherds and olive growers turned philosophers and statesmen. But today, like in Ukraine, it is those farmers who are being hit hardest by the corporatization of agriculture. As ancient Athens grew, the temptations of wealth and empire led inevitably to war. 
the ideal of a government founded on virtue disappeared. And Aristotle says when a society becomes diseased with plutocracy, he calls it, the word in Greek is pleonixia, and that means the wish for more, more of everything. Well, that's our consumer society. And that is the reason that we continually drive ourselves into debt. I mean, you know, the plutocracy manages to extend easy credit to large numbers of American people who are conned into thinking that they are entitled to the good life that they cannot afford, but then they, they borrow money and the credit card companies charge them 20% and just plunder them. The image, if not the substance, of democracy, the religion of the consumer economy, the chance to make everything right with a single throw of the dice. Hitting the jackpot in a game the plutocrats fixed long ago. But at week's end, the faithful fly home to a radically changed America. In 2008, as Wall Street CEOs paid themselves millions in bonuses for nearly destroying the economy, $13 trillion of household income disappeared. Over five million families were evicted from their homes. Echoes of a long suppressed anger could be heard in legislatures and town halls across the country. 4% of the American people own 85% of the wealth of America. And that over 70% of the people of America don't own enough to pay the debts that they owe. How many men ever went to a barbecue? and would let one man take off the table what they intended for nine-tenths of the people to eat. The only way you'll ever be able to feed the balance of the people is to make that man come back and bring back some of that grub he ain't got no business with. We read one day, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But if a man doesn't have a job or an income, he has neither life nor liberty and the possibility for the pursuit of happiness. He merely exists. The issue of wealth and income inequality is the great moral issue of our time. It is the great political issue of our time. It is the great economic issue of our I made my first film in Canada, a portrait of Fort Chipewan, a native village in the far north that survived on trapping and fishing, Alberta's oldest community. It was 1970. People looked after each other. The benefits of the local economy were shared. Then upstream on the Peace River, a massive dam was built to provide power for Vancouver and the lower mainland of British Columbia. Local lakes the river fed began to dry up until trappers had to resort to dog teams to launch their boats. We just don't know just what we're going to do. And this is how long it's going to be last. We don't know. Electricity enough for the smelters, enough for the factories, enough for the pulp mills and the refineries. Do we have to have a battle over it? Do we have to have Narvin go and go down and blast this dam? If there have to be another Louis Riel's rebellion, I think I'd be one of them. It was only the beginning. Thank you. 
Within years, corporations like Exxon, BP, Shell, and Total arrived to develop the tar sands. Multinational plutocracies with incomes larger than most countries. The mines are like feudal domains, with airstrips for the executive jets of the plutocrats, each a nation unto itself, beyond the reach of the local community, effectively beyond the reach of government. In, uh, in our particular part of the world is, is the tar sands, and what's happening there is, is beyond imagination. They're not hungry for oil, they're hungry for money. Traveling on the water, the water tells you that there's something is going, going wrong. And you need to take notice of that. I'm endangering myself sometime. That's how I'm thinking, that being on a river. Because I know if I drink this water that, I, that my health is in jeopardy. It's an indefensible project. And its only defense is that it produces money. It's money that comes at a hideous cost. That's been enough in Canada to drown out the voices of its better angels. As every day that it stays open, it's pouring more carbon into the atmosphere that we can't afford to have. And of course, the U.S. is equally complicit in the whole thing. We're the junkie that's buying the, you know, buying the drugs that Canada's peddling. When I returned to Fort Chip in 2010, the water had been polluted. People no longer ate the fish. Cancer rates had doubled in communities downstream from the tar sands. This is not a normal industry. This is the most powerful industry on the planet. ExxonMobil, at one point, is making up to a billion dollars a day. So these guys have the cash to print any message they want buy any messenger they want. I mean, the money is so great and so extraordinary, it can basically deal with almost any form of opposition over time. That's how business is done in a resource economy. As local economies disappeared, 43 billion more dollars poured into tar sands expansion. The CEO of Exxon, Rex Tillerson, raised his salary to $40 million a year. Christian Freeland has brought her son, Ivan, to visit her father in the Peace River country of northern Alberta. The family has farmed here for a century. This was once the last outpost of settlement in the Americas, where immigrants from across Europe came to start again, beyond the reach of the plutocrats. <laughs> We are in Peace River, in the Peace Valley. So this is really where my family has been since my great-grandparents came up here, in the Peace Valley. Up there is Misery Mountain, uh, so-called because it was a pretty hard place to be a pioneer. Just over that hill over there, there's a little grave site called Pioneer Cemetery where my grandparents are buried. When I was born, we lived in kind of a shack just at the end of the field where my grandparents lived. This is really the frontier out here. Um, my dad owns a breaking plow and I've plowed with him. And what that means is it's, it's the kind of a plow you use to plow up essentially parkland or forest land and make it a field. Um, like we are really at the edge of cultivated human life. 
This idea that, there's, that the world is infinite and we can do what we want in it because there'll always be enough is deeply rooted in our culture. I, I think it has the traction of a religious idea. When Queen Victoria died, which is only just over 100 years ago, the human population was a quarter what it is now, but the world economic output was about a 50th of what it is now. In other words, 2%, which is a rough measure of the impact of humans on the Earth. The people who ended up here were people who wanted to be very independent and not bound by social convention or social stratification. Um, they were people really who wanted to be responsible themselves for their own destinies. Like Ukraine, the family farm is disappearing on the Canadian prairie. Agribusiness now controls the economy of grain, from planting to harvest. Monopolies now control the choices farmers have to get their grain to market. When a multinational decided to shut down a local railway, the people of Forestburg, Alberta, went door to door and raised $5 million to buy the train themselves. The only problem was they now had to learn to run it. All you do is drop it in, bolt it in, torque it in, start her up. So it was the same here, Harvey, as far as turning stuff on electrically? You gotta set switches differently for which edge it's gonna take control. Oh yeah, okay. okay. Clear to go ahead. So it's uh, very, it's a kind of a success story in a lot of ways. Especially nowadays when we have so much uh, multinational uh, control of everything and, and our, our destiny is dictated to us, we've just said, no, we want to, we want to work with this one on our own. So many battles have been lost to special interests, to the plutocrats, that every victory, however symbolic, seems to matter. In the provincial capital, the impact of the tar sands has been enormous. Alberta has the highest income inequality in Canada. The shelters on which the homeless depend will be displaced by the entertainment district. What we're doing is discarding our poor, our weak, our elderly. Uh, we're about to go through uh, severe cuts, which will affect the most vulnerable, so people can come in and work at minimum wage without any kind of benefits. Again, it's this kind of race to the bottom. With the falling price of oil, the services that once came to the aid of the homeless have themselves fallen victim to government deficits. And yet the lion's share of profits from the oil industry continue to flow out of the province to head offices in Houston and New York. The population of Alberta is about the same as Metro Montreal. It's smaller than Phoenix, smaller than Houston. For years, Alberta has sold more oil to the U.S. than Saudi Arabia sells to them or anybody else. For years, we've been selling more natural gas to the U.S. than anybody else sells to them. And yet we can't balance a budget. We ought to be swimming in long-term wealth. We ought to actually have hospitals where people don't have to be double bunked in a single room. And that's happened because our institutions of government have all been captured. If you were looking for the threats to democracy from plutocracy, this would be a really good case study to, to start from. Norway is really the only place that's handled this well, and it's done that because the institutions uh, maintain their integrity. The institutions of the civil service, of the political parties, they all said no to the plutocrats, and they kept the wealth. And Norway's set forever. When I returned the next month, the homeless had moved on. The ice district was another step closer to completion. But the church was locked. Wayne Gus is going back.
In New York, the mansions of the plutocrats perch on the top of the luxury towers of Manhattan. The salary of a top CEO is now 844 times greater than that of the average worker. I mean, there are two worlds in New York and all over the world. I mean, there are the people who travel on private planes. Their children go to private schools. They have much more in common with the plutocracy in, say, France, England, Mumbai, China, this globalization. But, but they, they really do live a different life. In the last century, American plutocracy has been built at the expense of working people. From steel mills to oil fields, dangerous working conditions led to strikes and labor unrest. The plutocrats retreated to their estates. The Gilded Age had begun. There are always forces that are going to be trying to capture democracy. This is what moves Carnegie. Carnegie is the, the first great American philanthropist, and in 1888, he writes The Gospel of Wealth. In 1901, he, he sells U.S. Steel to J.P. Morgan for $480 million, becomes the richest man in America, and says, a rich man who dies with his wealth intact dies disgraced. You will notice that most of this construction is luxury uh, real estate. It's, we're not making public housing. We're not building bridges. We're not building common infrastructure. Our common infrastructure in this country, that is to say roads, bridges, schools, the thing on which the democracy depends, our commonwealth, we're not building any of that. We're building expensive, private apartment buildings. We have apartments now selling for $95 million on the, on the 89th floor in the, in the building on 57th Street. And a lot of these apartments are being sold to rich uh, plutocrats from around the world. And now with the increase, it'll be well over $10 billion. So I don't need anybody's money. Actually, people are setting up packs all over the place. I don't care. If they want to give it to me, I'll take it. Money is boss. Cash is king. And I, Trump, am an embodiment of, of that. I don't need myths. I do deals. He says, trust me because I am rich. The American people over the last 30 years have lost faith in the, in the story of, of democracy. The, the, democracy is seen as uncivil and unsafe, not effective in a world surrounded by terrorists and enemies of all kinds. As banks make trillions in the financial revolution, government regulation disappears. Wall Street spins out of control. The ordinary American is left behind. Transactions now take half a millionth of a second. The survival of the fittest in a digital age. Gaming the market. Hedge funds, derivatives, subprime mortgages. A financial revolution amasses vast fortunes. Across the country, a deep distrust of the financial system takes root. A new World Trade Center rises from the ashes. Little has changed. Profit still drives America. The banks direct the global economy at warp speed. What we just saw in the city of Camden, New Jersey, which per capita is the poorest city in the United States, 
they fired, and also, by the way, the most dangerous, uh, they fired the entire police force because it was unionized, hired a countywide non-unionized police force, incorporating some of the old officers back into it, and paying them 50% less. That's the future. What we're seeing is a global corporate state uh, that has no loyalty to any particular nation state. They've devastated my country, the United States. They've devastated huge sections of Canada as well. And they play workers around the globe off of each other so that uh, the working class in the industrialized countries are told they have to be competitive, which in a global marketplace means being competitive with prison labor in China or sweatshop workers in Bangladesh who make 22 cents an hour. Camden is a microcosm of what's happening across the country. Whole communities turn to graveyards as jobs move offshore. All government is oligarchy of one kind or another. There's, there's no way around that. And that, that was true of the founders of the American Republic. Madison defines them as men with the wisdom to discern and the virtue to pursue the common good of the society. You have to keep tinkering. You have to keep uh, remembering that virtue is more important than wealth. In our day, certain economic proofs have become accepted as self-evident. A second bill of rights under which a new basis of security and prosperity can be established for all. The right of every businessman, large and small, to trade in an atmosphere of freedom Freedom from unfair competition and domination by monopolies at home or abroad. America was magnificent in 1945. It was the supreme military, economic, and moral power in the world. And we are no longer that. I traveled to Wisconsin in 2012, where the dark money of the Koch brothers was financing Governor Scott Walker's attack on the public sector. Teachers, nurses, firefighters took to the streets in protest. Walker had introduced Bill 10 to cut back civil service salaries and the right to collective bargaining. Outraged citizens gathered the million signatures required to force a recall election. He's not just attacking us, he's attacking the, everybody in the country. He doesn't care who it is. He's working off the, the playbook for the Koch brothers. Right. Plain and simple. He's a Koch whore. The Koch brothers spend a lot of money to uh, destroy the public sector, and they've done quite a good job of it. Um, I mean, they're not alone, but they're part of these, this very sort of retrograde element. Rapaciously wealthy and rapaciously powerful, able to control the political system, able to control the public discussion. Uh, and they've really made war on, on the working class, and, and, and they're winning. Wisconsin has a long history of populism, dating back to fightin' Bob La Follette, who challenged the railway trusts in the 1920s. The patriotic citizenship of the country must take its stand and demand of wealth that it shall conduct its business lawfully, that it shall no longer furnish the most flagrant examples of persistent violation of statutes while invoking the protection of the courts, that it shall not destroy the equality of opportunity, the right to the pursuit of happiness guaranteed by the Constitution, that it shall keep its powerful hands off. It's coming together for the, the, the working class, the middle class. Um, I think that we realize that we can maybe defeat some of the money that we're up against. That's how unions work. We stand together. Uh, it's how firefighters work. When our neighbor has a problem, you respond to it. If you don't have a seat at the table, it's because you're probably on the menu. We work together to pass bill after bill to show that Wisconsin is open for business. Our state cannot grow if our people are weighed down paying for a larger and larger government, a government that pays its workers unsustainable benefits that are out of line with the private sector. We need a leaner and cleaner state government. 
In Kiev, Christia Freeland moderates a panel on corruption within the plutocracy. How many people have been fired or prosecuted for corrupt activity in government? Especially in the last six months. Okay, you know what? This is our good... And I, and I, I, I put that in the context of the United States, where since President Obama came into office five years ago, there have been 6,000 people at the local, state, and federal level that have been prosecuted and convicted for corrupt activity in government offices. 6,000 people, including last week, the governor of the state of Virginia and his wife were convicted on 16 counts uh, for taking money in return for favors. Uh, Katya Gurczynskaya, she's the deputy editor of KU Post. Um, when the current government came into place, Prime Minister Yatsenyuk said that According to their estimates, the previous government, at the highest level, stole about 70 billion worth of wealth from Ukraine. And that was the original estimate. Since then, it's been growing. It's now 120 or something like that. And that's about, you know, Ukraine's budget this year is about 30 billion. So that gives you the scale of corruption. As news spread of the Walker cutbacks, people on Twitter and Facebook around the world began to order pizzas for the students occupying the legislature. Phoning in their credit cards, they would feed the protesters for the hundred days of the occupation. This is what democracy sounds like, sounds right. It got the people well tight. The lessons of Wisconsin is never say never. Even if you've got billions of dollars on your side, a compliant government that acts as your handmaiden, you've got all the power in the world and you are the creators of wealth and power and fame, you cannot control people. And the people rose up as one and said, this is one step too far. This is what democracy sounds like, sounds right. It got the people bound tight. The recall election finally arrives. Despite a final push by the unions and their allies, early results show the governor in the lead. Somehow they're projecting that Walker's already won, but I don't believe it yet. I won't believe it till a little later when the votes are all counted, not just some of them. Walker wins 52% of the vote. The result follows an all too familiar pattern in American politics. Money wins. Walker's defense, financed by the Koch brothers, had outspent the recall campaign seven to one. The smaller the government, the more susceptible it is to the power of corporate interests and outside pressures, especially economic ones. But also, I think that there has been a, a decay in the power of governments generally in the Western world. We've gone back to the idea that uh, corporations should be enthroned because the creation of wealth is the ultimate good in society. Uh, and, you know, I'm not saying the creation of wealth is a bad thing, but I think I grew up at a time when it was simply, the economy was simply one pillar of a society that had many pillars. Independent Square, which is now uh, often called Yevro Maidan, uh, the Euro Maidan. It has been the center of Ukraine's democracy movement. I am against any any um, signs with uh, Moscow. This is just, you know, this is just a death for Ukrainian economy and for Ukraine. It started with a protest in Kyiv, which became a mass protest whose center was right here. In 
It was in the Maidan that Vladimir Putin's plan to make Ukraine a satellite of Russia came up against the power of democracy. The enemy was Putin's friend Viktor Yanukovych, the Ukrainian president, who rejected the economic union with Europe his people had chosen and began to negotiate a deal with Russia. To the surprise of everyone, I think including Ukrainians, uh, the country exploded. Like in Wisconsin, protesters try to occupy the legislature, but this time, on Yanukovych's orders, the troops open fire. A hundred demonstrators are killed. The country rises up against the president, and Yanukovych flees to Russia. I first visited the Maidan at 7 o'clock on a Sunday morning. The families and friends of the victims were already there. The group that is called now the Heavenly Hundred, these were the protesters who, when the snipers started firing, actually marched directly into sniper fire, many of them protected only by uh, garbage can lids as shields. After Yanukovych fled, his big dacha outside Kyiv was opened up and became for a while a sort of public national monument. And people saw absurd things, like a golden loaf of bread. Someone set up a Twitter account of Yanukovych's golden loaf of bread, uh, a fake pirate ship organized as a personal restaurant, a personal zoo. I mean, it's, it's really um, oligarchy to the extreme. And, and what Yanukovych was building was an oligarchy designed to enrich his personal clan. As the new government attempts to heal the wounds of the past, they open the Yanukovych palace to the public. It's both horrifying and really inspiring to be here because you think about this, this place, it's, you know, it could be a huge vacation complex or a huge park. And it was one guy, all stolen from the people of Ukraine. And I think being here is a way of saying, you know what, you son of a bitch, you took this from us, but now we've taken it back. The estimate of the Ukrainian Maidan activists is uh, that Yanukovych stole around $70 billion worth, and that that is now held in his foreign bank accounts. $70 billion is a lot. I'd finally made it into the house of a plutocrat, but all I could think of was the Maidan, the young men and women who had been killed. The Ukrainians who wandered through the rooms had the look of trespassers. What kind of person could have lived here?
Christian Freeland approaches the site of a remarkable plutocracy from the past. 800 years ago, Marco Polo opened the Far East to commerce. Venetian merchants capitalized on his discoveries to build one of the wealthiest trading empires the world has known. Something amazing obviously happened here once. had uniquely for that time in Europe a system that encouraged entrepreneurship. If you were a hard-working, risk-taking, alpha kind of person, you had a shot at making it to the big time. It's all about trading, but ultimately it's about making money. So I'll read you a quote, and this was from uh, Francesco Petrarca, um, who was probably sitting close to where we are right now. Uh, sitting at a Venetian window overlooking the basin of, of St. Mark. And he wrote a letter to a friend in the 14th century. Uh, he was looking at the boats, looking at the trading ships. If you'd seen this vessel, you would have said it was not a boat, but a mountain swimming on the surface of the sea. What is the source of this insatiable thirst for wealth that seizes men's minds? Interestingly, and people see this in the records uh, that were kept in Venice, what you would expect, tremendous turnover at the top. It was the best traders. The traveling partners, if you were a great traveling partner, you would rise up to the top. But when you're in the elite itself, it's not that comfortable to constantly have these guys from the bottom coming up and challenging you. And so, you know, this very wealthy, very entrepreneurial elite slowly starts closing down that opportunity, starts closing down the open system which created it with the publication of the Libro d'Oro, the Book of Gold. And that book listed the names of the nobility. From then on, in order to be a member of Venice's ruling oligarchy, your name had to be in the book. Even at the time, the Venetians described what was happening. And so they named it, it's called La Serata, the closure, the cut. And that it was really the beginning of the end. In the case of Venice, where the, it was a very entrepreneurial trading place that suddenly, you know, you were able to set up little corporations and invest in ships to go out and everybody could play the game. Uh, as soon as they got rich enough, they decided, well, let's not let anyone else in. Let's not let anyone else play the game. Let's, in fact, uh, stop the sources of capital and mobility. And that brought Venice down very quickly. I couldn't get Venice out of my mind the rising ocean that every morning floods the city. I wondered whether climate change, driven by the global economy, would be the final legacy of today's plutocrats. I mean, unfettered capitalism, as Karl Marx understood, is a revolutionary force. It commodifies everything. Human beings become commodities. The natural world becomes a commodity. You have the tar sands that it then exploits until exhaustion or collapse. It knows no limits. 40% of the summer Arctic sea ice melts, and the oil companies look at it as a business opportunity. The death throes of the planet, they're dropping half billion dollar drill bits down there to get the last vestiges of oil, natural gas, minerals, and fish stocks. Um, you know, we're all on Herman Melville's The Pequod now, when his novel Moby Dick, um, named for an extinct Indian tribe, and Ahab's in charge. The great Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis in the early part of the century says, and I quote, you can have the concentration of great wealth and you can have democracy, but you cannot have them both. So we, we have a plutocracy trying to pretend that it is still a democracy. 
I visited the abandoned summer homes of the Venetian aristocrats, monuments to a business empire that believed it would never end. I thought of Marco Polo setting off from these gardens for what must have seemed like the end of the earth. How with time, as the kingdoms of the plutocrats grew, every limit to growth would be surpassed. I thought of the cost, globalization, privatization, the millions of women and men whose lives are being declared surplus. Are we in the midst of a second serata? This time the closure of civil society, the level playing field on which democracy depends, infinitely more valuable than an order of merchants. As more and more people are abandoned by the plutocracy, we need to realize what is really at stake.